Hello and welcome to this training. My name is Benedetta Cordaro. I am the Information Management Officer of the Counter Trafficking and Emergencies Unit within the Migrant Protection and Assistance Division in IUM HQ. Here you can find my contact details, so please do not hesitate to reach out should you have any queries or needed any support in, uh, in your activities. Today I'm going to walk you through some basic concepts related to counter trafficking information management and uh, the displacement tracking matrix. We're going to start from the very definition of trafficking in persons, which is provided by the third article of the UN Protocol to Prevent, Suppress and Punish Trafficking in Persons, especially women and children, which is normally referred to as the Palermo Protocol. According to this uh, third article, trafficking in persons is defined as the recruitment, transportation, transfer, harboring or receipt of persons by means uh, of the threat or use of the force or other forms of coercion, of abduction, of fraud, of deception, of the abuse of power or of a position of vulnerability, or of the giving or receiving of payments or benefits to achieve the consent of a person having control over another person for the purpose of exploitation. Now, this definition is pretty long and articulated, so now we're going to break it down and provide some practical examples. Trafficking in persons, when referring to adults, present three key components. Act, which is what is done. By act, we mean, for instance, harboring, reception of a person, recruitment, transport, transfer, and again, any other activity, any other action that might be attributable to the trafficker. The second component is represented by the means, meaning how it is done. An example of means can be abduction, abuse of power, abuse of vulnerability, coercion, deception, fraud, uh, threat or use of force, withholding of payments. And in general, any modality the trafficker can use to exert a control over the victim. And the trafficker wants to exert control over the victim for a purpose. And this purpose, meaning the third component of trafficking in persons, is exploitation. Exploitation is not uh, defined by the UN protocol, by the Palermo protocol, uh, however room is normally left uh, in, uh, depending on the national legislations, so exploitation might be defined in a way or in another. But here you can find an examples of forms of exploitation that uh, IUM workers uh, might uh, uh, find while working at field level. So this could be, for instance, uh, child labor exploitation, coercive illegal activities uh, such as uh, stealing or selling drugs, uh, coercive reproduction, domestic servitude, forced labor, labor exploitation, forced marriage, forced military recruitment, illegal adoption, organ removal, prostitution or sexual exploitation, slavery, and so on. Again, any forms of exploitation would be considered part of purpose. These three components must be um, existing at the same time and being correlated for a case to be considered trafficking in persons. So, considering that trafficking in persons is a crime and a human rights violation, we can imagine, for instance, a lawyer um, or a social worker or a protection officer having to prove that a case is actually trafficking in persons. So, in that case, the lawyer, the social worker and so on will have to prove each of these and prove that they are correlated. Now, this is again, as I was mentioning, the strict uh, legal uh, um, definition. We will see later that uh, when we work, uh, when we look at tra trafficking in persons uh, more from an information management perspective, we might not need to stick strictly uh, to the need to demonstrate that the three components are correlated to one another. When the definition of trafficking in persons uh, is uh, applied to children, then from a legal perspective, means uh, do not need to be proved. Again, from an information management perspective, we will see that the situation is slightly different, meaning that while legally means do not need to be proved, from a research perspective, of course, we are still interested in learning about means. And this is because the information management activities that we conduct have the purpose of uh, informing a program implementation, such as a prevention or assistance or advocacy. And to be able to do so effectively, of course, means have to be studied and understood also when it comes uh, to children. I also would like at this point to add a note about the terminology. So far, you've heard me speaking about the victims of trafficking. Now, some sources prefer the use of, uh, the term of a different terminology. They would refer to victims uh, of trafficking as uh, trafficking survivors. Um, and this is quite important because uh, it has uh, 
um, the purpose of stressing the resilience of the former victim of trafficking. In the case of this training and in the case of the counter trafficking and emergencies information management guide that you will find in the references at the end, uh, the decision has been taken to use the word victim because uh, in the kind of information management activities that we do, we hardly ever deal with former victims of trafficking. And we most likely refer to people who are still victim of trafficking while the phenomenon is being studied or that unfortunately didn't survive. So because of this, uh, it has been uh, chosen to keep on using the um, terminology of victims, while in other publications or other sources uh, might very legitimately, and uh, very often it is actually preferable, refer to former victims of trafficking as survivors. I'm now going to provide uh, some uh, um, more concrete examples, and for each scenario we are going to identify act, means, and purpose. So example number one. A migrant pays a smuggler to provide a transportation across the desert and cross the border. During the journey, the smuggler threatens the migrant to leave him in the middle of the desert if he does not carry drugs for him. So in this case, act could be, for instance, transfer or transport. What the smuggler would be accused of? What is the smuggler responsible for? In this case, is for instance, a transfer and transport. When it comes to the means, here the most intuitive one, the one that probably is the easiest to spot, is a threat, because the smuggler does threat the migrant, um, threat him to live in the middle of the desert. However, if we think about this scenario, we can actually identify a few more. For instance, uh, there might be deception. We might uh, uh, intuitively guess that the migrant didn't agree to this before starting the journey. So he was uh, uh, probably he agreed to certain condition before starting the journey and this condition changed in the middle of the journey. So we can consider also deception. We can include coercion because the person is obliged to do this. Uh, but also we can also take into account the abuse of power from the side of the smuggler and the abuse of a position of vulnerability of the migrant. And this is because we need to think that the migrant uh, in that moment uh, when he's uh, asked to carry drugs uh, and threatened to be left in the middle of the desert uh, doesn't have any sort of negotiation or bargaining power, has no options and no alternatives. So in this case, uh, clearly the smuggler is taking advantage of a position of vulnerability. The migrant has no other choice. And finally, in terms of purpose, uh, um, the purpose is quite clearly forced uh, illicit activity, in this case, uh, um, carrying drugs. We're now moving to a second example. A young IDP woman is offered to work as a maid in an hotel in a nearby coastal town where the owner would provide her accommodation. Once she arrives to the town, she finds out that the hotel is actually a brothel and she is forced into prostitution. The owner of the hotel keeps almost all her earnings, claiming that they share for accommodation and food. Without money, she cannot go back to her family. She is also afraid of returning without the money she was promised to support her family and she is terrified to tell what really happened, as her family and community would reject her. So in this case, the act can be harboring a reception of a person, possibly recruitment. In this case, for instance, we are not 100% sure that the recruitment has been done by the same person who is responsible also for the reception, but in general, this would fall under the category of act. When it comes to means, we can find more than one. It's important to highlight that there can be multiple means used at the same time. Uh, first and foremost, the deception about job opportunity. From the story, we learn that the young DP woman was offered the work and ended up into prostitution. She didn't accept that at the beginning. Um, as in the case of the migrant, we can identify uh, a form of abuse of vulnerability, meaning that in this case, the IDP woman has no alternative, has no negotiation power, no bargaining power. And so because of this, uh, this, is a ex um, this is an extra element to take into account when we think of why uh, she can be forced into a certain activity. She's forced into this activity, hence we can speak of coercion. Um, She's not given her earnings, and so withholding payments in this way, in this case, is used possibly in two ways. On the one hand, by not having means to pay the journey back, she can just not leave the place and go back to her family. But also we can think that, and this sometimes used, um, withholding payments but keep on promising that the payments one day will arrive is a way to keep the victim attached, is a way to uh, make sure that the victim would stick around hoping to get the money at some point. And finally, in this case, the trafficker also threatened the person to inform her family and community. 
And this is extremely important because uh, um, trafficking, human trafficking, is very often associated to very strong stigma, even more so if, as if related, for instance, to uh, prostitution or sexual exploitation. Uh, it is absolutely not rare, it is actually the rule, that the victims of trafficking will not report. Um, very often they are, again, uh, under some forms of control, they might be manipulated, and they might be given wrong information, and because of this they mistrust authorities, they mistrust uh, law enforcement or aid workers. So hardly ever they will reach out, uh, and hardly ever will actually tell their family or their communities what is happening, precisely because they fear uh, the stigma, they fear the rejection. So this is very important to be uh, remembered, to be taken into account, uh, because uh, we need to remember that uh, trafficking as a phenomenon tend to be very hidden. It is, a, as we mentioned, a human rights violation, it is a crime, and as such is hidden. It is difficult to spot and consequently it is also difficult to study. And finally, as a third point, we can identify the purpose, which is in this case um, quite clearly sexual exploitation. As a third and final example, militia groups kidnap kids from a Quranic school of a village. Kids are transported to another location. Teenagers are forced into combat roles, while younger boys are forced into support roles, such as cooking, taking care of the camp and collecting firewood. So in this case, act is represented by harboring, reception of a person and recruitment. Means, in this case, since we are talking of kids, so we are talking of people, of minors, of people who are under the age of 18, legally doesn't need to be proved. However, as mentioned before, from an information management perspective, of course we will be still very interested in learning how all this happened. Uh, we are interested in knowing, for instance, that this was a case of abduction. But at the same time, uh, we might be interested in knowing why uh, teenagers and children stick around uh, the military groups, uh, how they, uh, why they don't um, try to run away, for instance. Uh, and this might give us insight about uh, the form also of psychological manipulation that uh, they might receive. So again, even if uh, from a legal perspective, uh, we don't need to prove the means uh, uh, to prove that this is a case of trafficking, from an information management perspective, we are still very much interested in learning about it. And finally, in terms of purpose, uh, we're speaking uh, of forced activities within an armed group, which can be, again, different kind of uh, activities. They can be combat roles, but also support roles. Now, we need now to clarify the difference between smuggling of migrants and trafficking in persons, because they're often uh, mistaken one for the other one. So the definition of smuggling in, of migrants um, is given the, pro the protocol against the smuggling of migrants by land, sea and air, supplementing the United Nations uh, Conventions Against Transnational Organized Crime of the year 2000, same year and same convention um, of the uh, Palermo Protocol about uh, trafficking in persons. So according to the definition, smuggling of migrants shall mean the procurement in order to obtain directly or indirectly a financial or other material benefit of the legal entry of a person into a state party of which the person is not a national or a permanent resident. Um, so now we can see the actual differences between one definition and the other one. So starting from human trafficking, we noted that we need to note, first of all, that the consent is irrelevant. Um, even if the victim does give a consent to something, since this happened under the means, meaning there are means of control, there are forms of control that are exerted on the person, which can be violence, which can be threat, which can be deception, the consent is considered completely irrelevant from a legal perspective. A second important point is that the um, economic gain of the trafficker comes from the exploitation of the victim. And finally, no movement is necessary. So we might have noticed from the previous definition that when it comes to trafficking, there is no movement from place A to place B. Um, trafficking can happen internationally as much as domestically, but it is important to remember that for trafficking to happen, the victim does not need to move. Trafficking can really happen in the very spot, in the very city when the victim lives, for instance. It could happen in the very same house. Now, um, the differences uh, from a legal perspective between trafficking in persons and smuggling of migrants are quite striking. So while the consent is irrelevant uh, when we speak of trafficking in persons, uh, it is actually relevant when it comes to smuggling. Uh, 
um, while in the case of trafficking in persons, the economic gain of the trafficker comes from the exploitation of the victim. In the case of smuggling of migrants, the economic gain came from an economic transaction between the smuggler and the person who is smuggled, between the smuggler in this case and, let's say, the smuggled migrant or the smuggled refugee. It means that the refugee or the migrant gives something in exchange of, let's say, transportation to the smuggler. And finally, in the case of smuggling of migrants, a cross-border movement is included in the very same definition. So according to the legal definition, there can be no smuggling if you're not crossing a border. As you can see, this slide is disseminated with little asterisks, so now we're going to talk about them a bit more. With regards to the victim of trafficking definition, I already gave some information. Moving on to consent, uh, economic transaction, and cross-border movements, uh, we might actually realize that while the legal difference uh, um, is pretty clear, the difference when it comes to the application of this definition, when we actually look at the scenarios we typically see in our work, the definition might not be as clear. So first of all, when it comes to the consent being or not being relevant, it is important to remember that the dynamic of power between the smuggled migrant and the smuggler is not even. The smuggler always have um, the smuggler always has more bargaining power, and uh, it's very difficult to just draw a line and. Uh, identify very clearly when this dynamic of power is so much in favor of the smuggler to become in a certain way a form of means of control over the migrant. Um, so again, some of the dynamics of power between the smuggled migrant and the smuggler might very easily fall under the uh, means component of human trafficking. It is really hard to tell in certain situations. A second point has to do with the economic transaction between the smuggler and the person who is smuggled. So we saw that the key definition is uh, the key difference in the definition is that uh, um, the economic gain uh, when it comes to trafficking uh, comes from the exploitation of the victim in trafficking in persons and comes from an economic transaction in the case of smuggling. However, there is no definition of what exploitation actually is. So a, fair, a good question could be what is a fair price? So when do we say that uh, the smuggler is not exploiting uh, the migrant? Uh, what is a fair price? When does the price become too much and it is a form of exploitation? And also when it comes to a material benefit, what are we referring to? Does it mean uh, that it is an exchange of, a, of items? It is an exchange of objects? Is it an ex exchange of services? Uh, what can, what, how would, would we define a ma material benefit uh, um, engaging in sexual activities, for instance. Uh, is that exploitation or is it uh, a material, an exchange of material benefit? So none of this is actually clearly defined. And because of this, and since uh, this uh, uh, situation actually happens, it's really difficult to draw a line from what is just, again, an economic transaction and what actually become uh, um, exploitation. And finally, about cross-border, I think it is really important to remember that while the legal definition per se is applicable only um, when there is a, an international border that is crossed, we need to remember that if we're looking at the trafficking in persons as a social phenomenon, not just at the legal definition, and we just saw that the boundaries in reality between trafficking in persons and smuggling, although the legal definitions are so different, the reality is that the boundaries are pretty blurred. It is important to remember that smuggling in a way happens also within national borders. So especially in context um, where IUM is active, I'm thinking of a, a context of conflict or of natural disasters. In any situation in which freedom of movement is hampered because there are checkpoints, because, for instance, there is the need to own a specific um, permission to go to govern from governorate A to govern, governorate B, even within the very same country, all those situations are likely to create a form of smuggling. Um, which do not comply with the international definition of smuggling, but are de facto a form of smuggling, meaning that uh, even uh, inhabitants of the very same countries uh, will look for ways uh, to cross internal borders uh, without going through the checkpoint, without having uh, to present uh, their IDs uh, to the authorities, uh, for instance. So it is important that we remember this, uh, because what we just saw is that uh, the legal definitions are very different, uh, but sometimes uh, 
when it comes to, to trafficking in persons and smuggling, the actual difference uh, um, in reality might not be so clear. And definitely smuggling uh, presents a lot of risks uh, that uh, um, might basically smuggling very easily can transform into trafficking. And so we need to keep our eyes open even when um, we are in, in front of a form of smuggling that might be within national borders and not only internationals. So in conclusion, we need to remember that we are in front of a very fluid dynamic. Smuggling can easily turn into trafficking, and even if legal definitions are clear, realities can be very blurred. Now, why, all this, uh, why is all this important for us uh, as uh, IUM working in uh, humanitarian responses uh, or in uh, or in emergencies. Well, counter trafficking uh, that we just saw being extremely intertwined with basically any activities that IUM does. It has to do with mixed migration, it has to do with uh, internal displacement, it has to do with conflict, it has to do um, with natural disasters. In general, human trafficking, trafficking in persons is exacerbated um, by emergencies. Um, emergencies create the new, new uh, factors that fuels uh, uh, trafficking. However, despite that, the counter-trafficking activities are not mainstreamed in humanitarian responses. Very few humanitarian needs overviews or humanitarian response plans mention trafficking, and very often if it is mentioned, it is in the form of a narrative, so no data are provided, it's typically anecdotal. Um, some forms of response some forms of counter-trafficking activities are absorbed into child protection and gender-based violence, but from a very child protection or gender-based gender -based violence appro uh, angle approach, which means that uh, while certain aspects uh, might actually be um, tackled, others are completely ignored. And finally, very rarely there are specific task forces uh, or working groups in place uh, to deal specifically with uh, country trafficking. Um, this is, uh, just a few, these are just a few examples provided by the uh, in IUM publication addressed human trafficking and exploitation in terms of crisis. So we can see, for instance, that uh, child protection or GBV tend to address uh, some problems uh, such as uh, forced child labor, forced early marriage, uh, child violence and abuse, forced prostitution, domestic violence and so on. However, typically other factors uh, such as uh, labor exploitation, slavery, um, exploitation of stranded migrants, abduction of stranded migrants, uh, um, kidnapping of migrants for ransom payments, uh, which are always activities in which IUM is heavily involved, they tend to be unaddressed. And so the purpose of introducing information management for counter trafficking is uh, to provide evidence and information to be able to inform existing programs, informing existing activities, but also help setting up new ones that can address also um, all these situations that as of now are not, are, are not addressed in a comprehensive way at least. So now, what is the actual purpose of counter trafficking in emergencies, information management, and what it should do? So first of all, as I mentioned at the beginning, we're not interested in proving individual cases. What the counter trafficking in emergencies should do is investigate and provide information on the general context, meaning pre existing and new trafficking patterns and trends, trafficking drivers, modalities through which the present crisis has had an effect again on the patterns and trends. So we want to understand the context, we want to understand what is happening, bearing in mind again that uh, human trafficking is a crime, is a human rights violation, and as such is hidden and underreported. Secondly, what we want to do is to identify risks that are related to trafficking and factors that might increase or mitigate these risks and the exposure of people to these risks. In particular, we also want to understand what are the most vulnerable groups and the factors that increase or mitigate uh, that increase or mitigate their vulnerability to trafficking. So once again, we're not going to investigate case by case, also because most of the time we will have no access uh, to individual cases. The purpose is to understand the context, trafficking patterns, trends, uh, pre-existing trends, uh, trafficking drivers, uh, risks of trafficking, uh, factors that increase or mitigate risks, uh, and vulnerable groups uh, to those specific uh, risks. At the same time, counter-trafficking in emergencies should never do um, 
other activities that might be uh, already quite challenging in more stable contexts and definitely not worth even attempting in a context of an emergency. The first one is attempting to produce prevalence, which is the, the total number of cases of trafficking in persons in a population at any given time. Um, this is a very resource intensive, challenging activity, it's very complex. Um, it requires a, a, an enormous uh, um, amount of effort uh, and the real problem is that uh, the likelihood to produce a decent result is very, very low, especially when it comes again to humanitarian responses. And the risk of under-reporting is extremely, extremely high. So in conclusion, producing prevalence uh, is uh, an unnecessary risk. We might actually provide very misleading results. Uh, um, and after all, it is actually unnecessary. It is unnecessary because the prevalence is not the information needed uh, um, to inform uh, inf a humanitarian response. When it comes uh, to protection programming or counter-trafficking programming, having an idea of the vulnerable categories, of the risks, uh, um, of the factor that mitigates uh, uh, or that uh, decreases these risks uh, is way more important uh, and way more useful for programming than just uh, counting the total number of cases. And finally, the idea is uh, that counter-trafficking information management should never, and I repeat, never attempt to screen or identify victims of trafficking. It is not a way to register beneficiaries. It is not a way to attempt to screen victims. It's not a way to attempt to detect them or identify them. Uh, this is the job of protection programming, of counter-trafficking programming. It is not the job of counter-trafficking information management. Now, having given this introduction, the real question now becomes how can a DTM tools and methodologies support information management for counter-trafficking? So, as you know, DTM has different components, such as mobility tracking, registration surveys, flow monitoring and flow monitoring surveys. So, um, in the references, you will find some links to uh, the counter-trafficking component within the DTM toolkit or within the uh, DTM data dictionary. In general, the um, idea that I want to pass in this moment, that there is, of course, not enough time to go into details, is that within DTM methodologies, there are some counter-trafficking specific indicators or proxies that has been um, added at HQ level, and we suggest missions to uh, to use them or, or adapt them to their context, but ideally to adopt them in, uh, in their national activities. Now, it is also very important to note that hardly ever these questions or these indicators have a big label counter-trafficking on them. Sometimes these are smaller questions uh, scattered in questionnaires that just once they're put together give meaningful information about the risks of trafficking. Um, a second kind of data that uh, is very useful for counter-trafficking information management is anything related to protection. So a lot of protection indicators, uh, uh, be they sex and age breakdown, um, vulnerabilities of women, vulnerabilities of children, in general any fact, any indicator that would typically fall under the category of protection is useful for counter-trafficking as well, since it is a form of protection. And finally, general indicators. So the idea is that you have a combination of all this general, of all these different kind of data, some very specific on counter-trafficking, some more on protection and some more generic, that analyze together, provide information on counter-trafficking. There is no expectation that one single questionnaire is full of counter-trafficking questions and will alone provide the straightforward answers for information management on counter-trafficking. So here I'm going to provide some key links. As I mentioned, the DTM data dictionary includes questions depending on DTM methodology to collect information on counter-trafficking and also explain how to do that and in what conditions, so what uh, requirements might must be met uh, for those questions to be used. Um, IUM has also produced and published uh, uh, the Counter-Trafficking and Emergencies uh, um, Information Management Guide, in which you can find an analysis framework and a list of indicators that can be used again to inform your activities or for analysis. And finally, um, still in the DTM, toolkit, uh, you can find an analysis plan that will help you, as I mentioned, to use uh, combined 
all the various kind of uh, data that the DTM tools uh, can provide to eventually produce uh, analysis that is useful uh, for counter trafficking. Here you can find uh, um, the link to the publication of the uh, counter trafficking and emergencies information management guide in English, Spanish, and French. And here you can find uh, some extra resources uh, on the counter trafficking and emergencies uh, um, portal where you can find uh, uh, specific trainings uh, on the topic, uh, but also where you can find extra information about research and data.